Praise the Lord family and God bless you and welcome to week one of Emotions. I will be tag teaming with Pastor Crow, Pastor Craig Groeschel, amen. I'll be tag teaming with him in a series that he actually started on last week. And as I began to watch that series, as I began to go through that series, um, it really ministered to my heart, ministered to me directly in a situation that I was dealing with. And the Lord just began to um, put some things in me that I wanted to share with you as well. So we're gonna start week one off um, with me and I'm gonna take you through what the Lord revealed to me and then um, we'll pick up from there, amen? All right, so uh, let's begin, all right? Um, I'm always excited to be here with you. I'm always excited to share with you the word of God, to share the things with you that he's been ministering to me. And I, I will do my absolute best to um, give it to you the same way he gave it to me so that you can have that same impact that when God is speaking, when his word is speaking, that is able to get into your heart and make change, allow change to happen in your life. Amen. So let's get ready to go into this message and I'm going to open up in prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, I thank you for being so good, so kind and so loving. God, I thank you for your word being active and alive. Lord God, and in us that we can take it and, 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 and eat it and digest it and, and see it come alive and, and grow and multiply into great fruitfulness in, in and through us, and Lord God, and in our lives and around us, Lord God. God, I pray that you open our hearts up today to receive everything that is spoken and that our ears are open to hear your voice. Lord God, even though I stand um, in this place, Lord God, to minister, Lord God, I pray that you minister not only to me, but through me as well, that you are the one that's heard today. Lord God, have your way. We surrender this time into your hands. Have your way, Holy Spirit. We acknowledge you, Jesus, as our Savior. For your word says to trust in the Lord with all thine heart and to lean not into thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. So we acknowledge you right now. And we thank you for directing our path. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 I'm excited. Let's go. All right. So turn with me to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 verses 11 through 16. As a matter of fact, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and give you... Um, a couple of other scriptures here. I'm not sure if I'll get through them all, but that way you'll have them up front. You can write them down. Um, Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 16. And then we have Luke chapter 11, verses 35 through 44. And then we have Colossians 2, verses 13 to 14. Again, that's Luke chapter 7, 11 through 16. Luke 11, 35 through 44, and Colossians 2, 13 through 14. But right now, as we start, we're going to dive into the word. We're going to go into Luke 7, 11 through 16. That's Luke 7, 11 through 16. And right now I'm going to read through the New Living Translations, NLT translation. Okay, Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 16. And it says, soon afterward, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain, or Nain, and a large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was going out as he approached the village. The young man who had died was a widow's only son, and a large crowd from the village was with her. And when the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion, saying, don't cry. Then he walked over to the coffin and he touched it and the bearers stopped. Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. Then the dead boy sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Great fear swept the crowd, and they praised God, saying, a mighty prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people today. Again, as Luke 7, 11 through 16, um, NLT translation. So, 
Now, that we've read our scripture, I have a couple of questions I want to ask you. If you could describe your Lord in one word, what would it be? Let me say it again. If you could describe the Lord in one word, what would it be? What would be your one word that you would describe the Lord with? Amen. And I'm take a moment, put it in the chat. Just write it down in the chat what you would describe that one word. Okay. If you can describe the Lord in one word, what would it be? For me, that one word would be father. That's the first thing that popped in my head. Father, my Lord. Okay. All right. Now, another question. What one word will you use to describe your current emotional state? What one word would you use to describe your current emotional state? You can say it out loud or for those who are here watching with us, you can type it in the chat. And if you're watching and you're not participating in the chat, just go in, in the chat, I said chat, in the chat. <laughs> go ahead and just log in. You don't have to sign up. You can pick a nickname and then join the chat and participate with us that way. But what one word would you use to describe your current emotional state, your current emotional state of mind? All right. All right, one word. What one word would you describe your current emotional state? Now for me, that one word, well, a few words came to mind. Um, angry, frustrated, shock, confusion, numb. Yes, I'm talking my current state. And it's not this exact moment, but what I've been dealing with this week, those are the words that came to mind. But if I had to sum it up with one word, it would be hurt. I was hurt. And I just want to reflect back to this message. And I want to take a look at what we saw with this mother. OK, a mother, a widow, um, someone who already knows the pain of losing a loved one. She is a widow, therefore she's already lost her spouse. Now the scripture is saying that she's lost her only son, a mother, a widow, someone who is familiar with this pain, who is now about to bury her only son. And she probably has a number of emotions at this point. And those emotions are accompanied by the last time she was in this place. The memories are probably coming back to mind of the last time that she was in a funeral procession. Um, the scripture says when the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. And he said to her, don't cry. Then he walked over to the coffin and he touched it and the bearers stopped. Now, this time, during this time, it was unheard of, unheard of, maybe even looked down upon or considered a disgrace to touch a dead body. According to the laws of their day, that was just something you did not do. And everyone knew that you don't do that. However, Jesus being full of compassion was willing to cross the line despite their laws and he touched the coffin. Aren't you glad that we serve a God who sent his only begotten son, Jesus, who was willing to cross the line for you? This is what love does. This is what love does for you. Love crosses the line that no one else is willing to cross. Now, one definition of sin means to cross the line, literally to cross the line and do what you should not do. But here we see one. Oh, my goodness. Jesus, who, who he crosses the line of their day, crosses the line mm, with compassion for you. <laughs> or can I say it like this? Compassion crossed the line for you. No boundaries, no rules, no laws can keep Jesus from loving compassionately. 
The scripture says when he touched, when he touched the coffin, the bearers stopped. I can only imagine that all the people gasped. <gasps> but don't you know that when Jesus touched that dead passive existence, oh my goodness, come on now. But don't you know when Jesus touches those things that appear to be dead and passive, passively existing in your life, that those things that you thought were lost, those things that you thought were dead, they'll gasp too? <gasps> yes, just like this young man who was lying dead, he breathed and life came back into his body. Mm. Come on. Jesus touched him and breath came back into his body. <gasps> and he sat up. Come on now. What do you need Jesus to touch in your life today? Let me tell you, family, <laughs> you are not out of breath. Say it with me. You are not out of breath. OK, say it like this. I am not out of breath. Now tell your neighbor, you are not out of breath. That same breath that God breathed, that breath into uh, the, the breath of life into your nostrils that caused you to become a living soul. Living souls, you are not out of breath. You're still breathing today. And if you're still breathing today, it's a continuation of the breath that God breathed in the beginning that now lives on in the side of you. You are not out of breath. <sighs> mm. And Jesus, because of him, the mediator between us and God, the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in, his touch Mm, my goodness, by his touch, that passive existence became an active existence. Let me tell you what I'm talking about when I say passive existence. This, this young man, he saw him dead. It was a funeral possession. He was there. Although he was dead, he was still existing, but existing in a dead state, inactive, passive, not alive. But when Jesus came in contact, when he touched that passive existence, existence, he became active existence. When he touched and breath came back, he actively became alive again, existing alive. We've been in a series called Command with Apostle Mike Klump. And one of the things he talked about is living and being in the existence according to God's word. And his word will program your mind to function in response to God's word, to be actively living out God's word in your life. But without God's word and without a response to that command, you'll have a passive existence. Some of us are living in a passive existing state when God intended you to be actively alive according to the activity of his word in you. Come on, y'all. Come on. Jesus, by his touch, that passive existence became an active existence. So that's the thing, family. Even this young man, even though this young man was dead, he still existed and it just wasn't active. It wasn't, it was, an, it just wasn't an active existence. There are some things that can exist within us in a passive state and emotions or such, some things such as emotions can exist in us in a passive state. And they can reveal, unearth themselves when certain things happen. Now, remember earlier, the mother, the widow, about to bury her only son, who probably had a number of emotions at that point that were accompanied by memories of the last time she was at a funeral procession. procession. Although obvious, what can clearly be seen with the naked eye is a mother mourning the loss of her son. But what, but it was also, it wasn't just a funeral procession for the loss of her son, but it was also a funeral procession of her emotions. And I could imagine what those emotions were, because here I am again, I've already lost my spouse, my husband, I've already lost one, now here I lose the only other, it was just the three of us, and now there's maybe angry or frustration or shock, and because of the shock, maybe there was confusion or numbness, 
this pain, a numbing pain, that kind of emotional hurt that hurts so bad, you don't even know how to feel. A funeral procession for her emotions. Yeah, it just hurts. <sighs> mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I had some emotions last week. And they existed in a passive state. And things that I thought were dead and buried until I felt the hurt, the pain, those emotions touched that passive existence of anger within me in that moment. And these thoughts just began, these memories just began to flood my mind. The memories came flooding back and it was a funeral procession, procession on a passive existence. Let me say it again. It was a funeral procession on a passive existence all over again, all over again. From the last time, the memories, come on. And I wanted to act on those memories. I wanted to yell, I wanted to kick, I wanted to scream, I wanted to punch. <laughs> Come on, let's just be real, y'all. In that moment, I wanted to do all those things, but Jesus, my God, he crossed the line for me. He stepped in and he stopped me. And he reminded me of one word, the one word he had just spoke to me on this week. What do you call, what do you describe, Pam, in one word, your Lord? And I said, Father. And in that moment when Jesus stepped in to stop what was starting, he crossed the line for me and reminded me that you called me father. And my father took hold of me. He touched me in that moment. And all of those horrible things I wanted to act on changed in that moment. Instead of kicking and screaming and punching, I spoke in a small voice just as he spoke to me when he touched me and comforted me. He crossed the line for me so that I would not have to cross the line in sin. Woo, help me Holy Spirit. Because according to 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, Jesus, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Let, let, let me put that in the chat for you. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And it says, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. My God. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Woo. All right, all right, all right. Okay, okay, okay. All right, let's keep going. Amen. Let's celebrate the fact that Jesus will cross the line for you. He crossed the line for you when he died on the cross for Cal on Calvary, when he died on the cross for your sins, so that you can live and respond and act on the word that you've kept hidden in your heart so that you won't sin against God. Okay, okay, okay. Woo. All right, let's keep going. All right, here we go. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. <clears throat> um, one more time. And if you're online with us here, there's a tab there that has the Bible in it. You can just click on that and you can follow along. And if you have your Bible with you, open it up. Follow along that way. Make sure you guys are taking notes, okay? Excuse me, sorry. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. And it reads, and this is King James Version, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out the way, nailing it to his cross. And I need to back up for a second and go to... Let's see here. Give me just a moment because I don't have both parts written out. Uh oh, can't bring it up. All right. Hmm. All right. I'll just read this again for you. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, 
which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now, let me paint a picture for you for just a second. Uh, my dad and my granddad love watching Westerns, okay? And when I was younger, I spent a lot of time with my grandfather during the summer times when I spent the summer with my grandparents and he watched Westerns. And my dad likes to watch Westerns. So I just grew up watching Westerns because they did. And one of the, the images that sticks out in my mind that I remember is the wanted signs, right? If someone did something wrong, they will put up these wanted signs and it will have a drawing of their face on there. It'll say wanted um, reward of thousand dollars or whatever. And they will put these wanted signs on it. And then sometimes it'll say because they did this. All right. Um, and then um, you can get something called a pardon letter. And if you got a pardon letter, this letter was pardoning you from whatever was a, you were accused of. And you can use that pardon letter to be released from whatever you were wanted for. OK, so um, then the signs will come down. Right. So when I read this scripture, that's the kind of thought that comes to my mind that um, the, the handwriting of the ordinances, the things that you have been accused of doing that's been laid out wanted child of god having anger <laughs> wanted person that's supposed to be a, a person of faith but still having depression wanted uh, a young man got mad and punched someone in the face but yet he says he's a christian wanted wanted a, a woman who used to smoke cigarettes and sell her body in the streets but now she's proclaiming to be a child of the most high god the enemy will keep trying to bring back these things that was written against you and try to put it in your face and proclaim that this is who you are. But now, as a child of God, under the blood of Jesus, these things have been blotted out. OK. All right. That's the picture I'm trying to paint for you, because there's some things that 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 they claim that they know about you. All right. So they're going to hold it over you. All right. Am I painting that picture good enough for you guys? And I apologize. It seems I'm not looking at you, but whew, it's hot in here. All right. But are you getting the picture? All right. Now, let's read the scripture again. Blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, that was contrary to us, taking it out of the way and nailing it to his cross. If I can say that there's a point here, because mm, I said, ha, ooh, ooh, help me hold the spirit. All right, I said the title of the message, if I, if I didn't say that clearly before, I'm telling you now, the title of the message is emotions. My point, number one is, they don't know you. So if we can put it together, emotions, they don't know you. Come on now. We don't have to allow our emotions to dictate who we are. Whoo. They don't know you. All right, so let's bring it back. Come on, come on back, Pam. All right, point number one, they don't know you. So back to our scripture. When Jesus walked up to the coffin, the first scripture, when Jesus walked up to the coffin and he touched it, they didn't know who he was. Now, the crowd already that was following, that was approaching this scene, they had witnessed and seen, but this is a different crowd. So it's two crowds. It's one that's following Jesus who's approaching this scene. And then there's a crowd following the, the mother, the widower, the one who is mourning and they're mourning and it's a funeral procession. So these two come together where Jesus is, Jesus walks on the scene on this other crowd. Okay. All right. So when Jesus walks up and he touches the coffin, they didn't know him. And can I be bold and declare that your own thoughts, ooh, they don't know you. Uh, I'll take it a step further. Um, they don't own you either. The thoughts don't know you and they don't own you either. That's the declaration we're gonna make today. There has been some ordinances written against you and they don't even look like you. 
They don't even sound like you. And the kinds of things that they claim you have done don't even match your walk with Christ. Come on now. They don't know you. And everything that has been spoken against you is contrary to you. Your name has been marked and stained. Now, now, when you blot out something, right? It said blotting out the ordinances of. We just talked about the ordinances of, but let's talk about the blotting. When you blot out something and, and, and uh, you, you say it was something written across here, right? Um, one of the things they used to do, like on a piece of paper, ooh, when you get a, 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 confident, a, 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 mm, a document that has um, confidential information on it, before they can share that document, it, it has to be redacted, right? And they blot out, they black out, they mark out the parts that you shouldn't be reading so that the confidential things are unseen and you're only able to read what you're allowed to see. They, it's blotted out, right? Blood blots that dark rich mm, woo, color of blood will blot something out and if you take it and, and, and just cover it up it will blot things out right and I'm not talking about on your skin but like on a piece of paper or cloth if you get a you cut yourself and you bleed and that blood gets on your 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 clothes it stains it so much so that it's capable of blotting out I had a better example but it's not coming to mind right now but I'm gonna keep going your, your name has been marked and stained. Now they think the ordinances, the one it signs, are the things that's marking and staining you. But, oh my goodness. Your name has been marked and stained with contaminated ordinances against you. They have slandered your name and called you up all kinds of things. All for the purpose of a cover-up. So, uh, as as for you not to be seen because they don't know you. Are you are you getting this picture? Um, if others were able to see you, they will also see the truth in you. But right now, the only thing they can see because they don't know you is what's been written against you. Uh, that they, they, they're allowing this to be the contaminated stain. Um, First John three and one. First John three and one. First John three and one says, "Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. If they ain't knowing him, <laughs> they ain't knowing him. If they don't know him, they don't know you. They don't know you." Your name has been obscured and their vision of you uh, has been blinded by obscurity, meaning because you are now a reflection of him and his perfection, they are now blind to who you are in him. Let me say that again. Um, if you are a reflection of him and his perfection, per yeah, his perfection, they are now blind to who you are in him because darkness cannot comprehend the light. He is the light of this world and so are you. If they don't know him, the word says, the scripture said, the world knew with him not. Excuse me, I said it wrong. The world knows us not because they knew him not. All right, I think I made that point enough. Let's keep going. You've been marked, blotted. They can't see you. They don't know you, why? Because of his blood, right? So we talked about what it means to blot something out, to, uh, to be marked, to be stained, um, to cover or cover writing or pictures with ink. We talked about that, right? Um, to obscure the view of, um, to disregard something painful, uh-oh, blot it, come on, stay with me. To dis disregard something painful in one's past or existence. See how I brought that back around? Blot it. And that's just definition. To disregard, blot it now, blotted. To disregard something painful in one's past or existence. I see the positives and the negatives in this because if you are not allowing the blood of Jesus to blot out the things from your past, you may try to find a way to pacify yourself and you can suppress certain things and 
began to allow this suppression to uh, disregard these painful things in your past or existence. And that's how you get to this passive place where you think it's been dealt with, but it's just been kind of pushed down in the surface. All right. And let me read this last definition here for blotted. This is a more medical, uh, chemical uh, definition, but I, I want to get to it because there's some things in here. Um, now, this word, this definition says a biochemical procedure in which proteins or nucleic acids separated on a gel are transferred directly to an immobilizing medium for identification. Okay? Key words in this whole definition is procedure, separated, transferred for identity. Literally, that's what's happening. They're using this procedure to uh, um, separate, to allow um, the blotting process to separate um, uh, and transfer directly into uh, another medium so that we can use it for identification. All right. All right, let's go. Whew. All right. God wants to take you through this biochemical procedure. <laughs> Let me help you out. God wants to take you through this blotting procedure. God wants to take you through this bloody procedure that was designed to help uh, identify who you are. But not only that, but it was also designed to separate you because it, it's, it's separating uh, what doesn't come on now, separating what doesn't belong so that you can see what needs to be belong that needs to be remain so that it can be transferred into the proper place for proper identity. God wants to take you through this blotting procedure designed to separate you from all others so he can transfer you directly into his kingdom. Saying, now, let me just put it all out there so it can be seen clearly, all right? So, so God takes you through this process so that you could be seen clearly on a grid. Now, <laughs> of defined lines. And I, I hope I'm making this clear because this is in my head. And I wish I had pictures to show you this. But if you have a grid, right? You have a grid of defined lines and you place things on this grid, the, the background of that grid, that grid becomes a background to what you place on it and it makes what's on top become more visible, right? So Jesus, God is taking you through this process and he's putting you on the grid defined by the grace of God um, where there's two defining lines like a cross ooh, come on is designed to separate your sin from you so on these defined lines called the cross where Jesus defeated death and sin for you God said he did this so that he can identify who is who because he knows you what am I getting at? Oh my goodness, I should have read the scripture before I went there because I know what I'm saying. The scripture again says, uh, blotting out the trans, excuse me, not the transgressions, blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, which was cross, 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 contrary to us, and took it out of the way. Here's where I'm getting to. Took it out of, separated it. The blotting separated, took it out of the way, separated, took it out of the way, and then nailed it to his cross. And, and what's missing from my notes here is that he made a mockery of it openly. I think that goes into verse 15, making a mockery of it openly, openly, openly. Whew. All right, let's keep going, let me keep going, keep going. So he does all this to put his mark on you, blot you, with his blood to separate these things that are against you, that are contrary. So those things could be taken away, taken out of the way, taken out of the way and nailed to his cross. Why? Because your identity is in him. He says, I know you. They don't know you, 
but I know you and I see you. I see you in your emotions. I see you in your hurt. I see you in your pain. But take those things and come to me. Your, the word of God says, cast those cares upon me and, and, and I will care for you. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for my yoke is easy and my burdens are light. God doesn't want you carrying around those things. He doesn't want you stuck behind those things. He wants you to walk in the true existence of who you are as a reflection of him because he knows you and he sees you and he's already died on the cross to separate you from those things so that you can live in the freedom of what you have access to in Christ. Woo! Yes. He's saying, yes, I see my reflection in you. I see my son in you. God said, when God said, let us create us, let us create man in our image. He looks down and sees his reflection in you because we're his image. He sees Jesus in you because we're his image. He sees the Holy Spirit in you because we're in his image. Jesus said in John chapter 14 that I am in the father and you, that's us. You are in me and I am in you. Not only do I know you, but I see you and I'm in you. And I just want to warn you today. If you don't deal with those, those, those that funeral procession of thoughts and memories and, and you allow them to keep going and going and going, you're, th you're thwarting, you're, 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 you're giving up your, what's the word I'm looking for? You forfeit. You're forfeiting the freedom you already had in Christ. Remember the declaration we made is they don't own you. Those thoughts don't own you. Those thoughts don't know you. You have access to freedom. Take hold of it. Grasp it. Do not limit yourself into thinking I can't get out of this. If I'm thinking it, I must be this. No, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Rashiro Samarasi. You are not who you think. Mm. I got to be careful how I say that. You're not who you think you are. Do not allow those thoughts to dictate who you are. You are a child of God. Jesus crossed the line for you so you can come out of sin. He took that stuff and separated from you and nailed it to his cross. So I don't care if the thought comes. The word says you can cast those thoughts, those evil and unclean thoughts of the imagination. You can cast them down and bring them into captivity before the obedience of Christ Jesus. He already obeyed the father until death for you. Ooh. So take that stuff before the obedience of Christ Jesus. Why? Because he already defeated it. It's nailed to his cross. It was made a mockery openly before everyone, the enemy, he knows. So don't let him trick you with thoughts and memories that come flooding black, back. And an, another key thing that I want to talk about today is what one of, the mess, one of the biggest parts of the message coming out of the last series called Command. The day, and it, 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 we talked about it, but I want to hone into it a little more because we have to be responsive to God's word and do what God's word. But the danger in that is when we don't. The danger in that is when we don't. <clears throat> I might have to break this down to another part two next week. But the danger is when we don't obey. Um, the point when and when we don't obey, we put ourselves in a position where God has to now ask the question, where are you? Adam and Eve in the garden. They had the opportunity to be with God, to walk with God. But after sin came in and they crossed into another territory because of sin that separated them from what they already had access to. The voice of God came walking through the garden asking, where are you? It wasn't as if he didn't know where they are, but all of a sudden there was a change and a separation in the spirit because of sin to the point that Jesus, that God had to ask, where are you? That's the danger I'm trying to warn you. You can't get to the place where he's like, where are you? Don't get to the place of disobedience that you take off the robe of righteousness. 
Remember that scripture that I put in the chat there earlier, that he was made the right, we were that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There's a robe of righteousness that we get to wear because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. But out of disobedience, you put yourself, you potentially put yourself to come out from under the robe of righteousness because you're making a choice to walk away from. You're making a choice to disobey. You're making a choice to be in sin when he already defeated. He already took off the limitations. So why would you go back and put God in a box by surrendering yourself to limitations that don't exist for you? Oh, boy. Let me finish up my last piece right here. <sighs> Don't, when you disrobe, when you disobey God and fall into sin, you self-separate. Hear me. You self-separate from him and go against his design. If, you're, if you willingly, willingly ignore God's call and you walk away from his gift and you trade your soul, your breath, just to gain this world. The word says, what does it profit a man to gain, uh, to, what does it profit a man to exchange his soul, to gain his world in exchange for his soul? I'm getting all the things mixed up. It, it profits you nothing if you're exchanging your soul just to gain this world. What does it profit a man to gain this world to lose his soul? Your breath. When you do that, you're in danger of becoming reprobate. You're in danger of becoming familiar with ways and with the ways and the curls, the cares of this world. You're in danger of allowing to have allowing to have the word of God choked out of you. You're in danger of being cut off. You're in danger of hearing at the judgment seat. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I know you not. I came to tell you today that God has a plan for you. You were designed to be a carrier of his presence. You were designed to carry the very essence of Jesus Christ through his blood, the same blood that was shed for you. Why? To cover you, to obscure you, to eliminate sin out of your life, to cover you from your sin, to cover your sins. To eliminate that passive existence uh, uh, of those ordinances that have been written against you, to change you, to wash you white as snow, all for the purpose of giving you a new identity in him through his blood. I pray for every person that was here today that's listening to this message that may have found himself in a situation woo, that they began to drown in flooded memories or the floods of passive existence. Memories that tried to overtake you and make you think that you are not who God has called you to be, that you can't identify yourself as a child of God, that you can't stand up and overcome in that moment and be who God has designed you to be, that tries to overwhelm you as opposed to you standing up in the presence of God. I, I want to pray for those people who may have found themselves in that place where their thoughts have just taken them way beyond where they, they, they wanted to be. And they're now thinking, how did I get here? How do I overcome this? Why am I thinking these words? I don't want to say these things. I don't want to do these things. I don't want to act this way. I don't want to lay in the bed all day. I, I want to get up, but I just can't, can't think, seem to find myself. I can't find the strength. I want to pray. Lord. I pray that you touch right now. The funeral procession has happened and our emotions has formed its own coffin. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that your compassion will reach in right now and touch 
and break down everything that has created and made itself into a state of limitation in our lives. That we would no longer be defined by the four walls of the coffin called our emotions. That we would no longer be defined by passive memories that existed in a buried state within us. Lord God, but when you touch today, God, thank you, Lord, for allowing that breath to come and be restored in us. In such a way that we respond in a hallelujah, that we respond in a thank you, Jesus, that we respond to you. God, I pray for renewed minds. I plead the blood of Jesus over our minds and over our thoughts. And I pray that every evil, every evil and unclean thought of the imagination that would dare exalt itself against the knowledge of God that we can come up against those thoughts and we rebuke them and cast them down and bring them into captivity. We take captive those thoughts today and we take them and we lay them before you in prayer today, Lord God. Oh, shit. Hallelujah. That you're able to raise us up out of the pit of that mindset and we can begin to declare by faith that I'm healed, that I'm set free, that I'm delivered, that I have the mind of Christ. For God's word says that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, a sound mind, sound according to your word, your doctrine, your, 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 your word, what you did for us. So I declare and decree in the name of Jesus, Sound mind because of your love and your power that's in us. Your word said God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works within us. So I help us, Lord God, to go from that place and walk into I can do all things through Christ. That strengthens me, God. I thank you for your anointing right now. Healing and transforming and changing and touching. That allows us to raise up, up out of those state and into I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. It's not of our own strength, but his strength in us. That we are able to live and move and have our being. God, I thank you, Lord. Whew. And that we'll come back to you. And we will humble ourselves and pray and keep coming back to you. And turning and repenting, Lord God. So that you can heal our land, that you will hear us when we call out, and you will heal our land, the land of our hearts, the land is our minds. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I also wanna take the time to pray as well for those who may be here that have not prayed the prayer of salvation, has never um, made the commitment to allow, I mean, to choose Jesus as your Lord and Savior to choose Jesus. Today, I want to give you this opportunity right now to choose Jesus, to call on the name of Jesus, to um, come to a place to allow him to reside in your life, to be Lord, to be Father, to be that one word that you can now have to describe who he is to you. Come on, let's pray. Pray with me. If you want to choose Jesus today, um, pray with me. There's going to be a little blue hand that pops up in the chat. You can click on that as well. But pray with me first. Let's pray this prayer right now. Um, say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I call on the name of Jesus to cross the line in my life. I call on the name of Jesus and I surrender my sins and I repent. Make me new in you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I receive it now. I believe Jesus is the Son of God and the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power whew, that's giving me new life right now, allowing me to have active, to be active and alive 
right now. Salvation is mine today. I believe it and I receive it now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. If you pray that prayer with us, you pray that prayer of salvation, I want to celebrate. I want to welcome you to the body of Christ. Welcome to Jesus. Welcome to this family of believers. And you know, if you pray that prayer with us today, click that blue hand and just let us know that you committed your life to Christ. We just want to celebrate with you. Um, when you click on that blue hand, it's going to go to a page that gives more detailed information, some scriptures, some things that you can do. There's also a form on that page you can click on if you choose to. You can connect with us, let us know who you are so we can continue to be a part of your family, this family. But we just thank God for you. Hallelujah. If you prayed um, with us earlier prior to this prayer and you want us to know the live prayer button is still open. You can, I said, but the live prayer button it's still open. You can click on that and we'll continue to pray with you there. Um, and at this time, we just want to prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. Uh, worship song is going to come on and um, the worship room will be open for a while longer. And I'll be in the chat with you in just a moment. But I want to just thank God for you. I love you. God bless. And we'll talk to you soon. <music>